Welcome everybody, in today's video we are going to cover 50 high yield rapid review questions for your emergency medicine EOR exam. So these questions are from the NCCPA blueprint for the pants and as well they'll cover your EOR. So let's begin. So when it comes to the high yield questions, the way I use them, the way I created them is to help me with this long stem. So what I've done in the past, I will usually just like read from the beginning and by the time I get to the end, I already forgot like half of the stuff that's in the stem. So now, the way I do test taking strategies, which I made a whole video on it, so you should go check it out. There's like 10 plus questions in there. So I would start with the last sentence first. So read the last sentence first. So that way you're not tripped by the long stem. If you press for a time, you can focus better. Which of the following should be next, not the best. Don't ever let that trip you as well. Which of the following should be the next diagnostic study you should order for evaluation of this patient? So I know this question is asking me what's the next study. One of these four, VQ scan. I know that it is scanned for DVT in the pregnant patients because they didn't want to be exposed to radiation. Bronchoscopy is a really invasive uh, test. Sweat chloride test and then an x-ray of the neck. So one of these four, whatever this patient has. So a 12 year old boy presents with a history of an intermittent cough productive of thick purulent sputum that is worse at night. That could be a lot of different things. His mother said it's associated with wheezing on occasion. She's concerned about asthma. The patient has no significant medical history. His older brother has asthma. You perform PFTs, chest x-rays, and culture. Culture shows 3 plus pseudomonas arginosa, and the chest x-ray shows bronchiectasis. So right there, I have my answer with the culture of the culture shown 3 plus pseudomonas arginosa. I know that is most common cause of cystic fibrosis in the young children, as well as bronchiectasis on a chest x-ray. So I know the answer is a sweat chloride test. So VQ would be for a pregnant, bronchoscopy is too invasive, and the neck x-ray is for epiglottitis. So you can see how this high yield information helps me when it comes to the selecting answer. But now let's continue with our high yield questions. Question number one. For human bites to the hand, prescribe what? So they're going to give you a long stem, patient got in a fight, they were at the bar or something, came in, and there's bites to their hands, and they're going to ask you which of the following medication would be the most appropriate to prescribe for this patient, and the answer is Augmentin, or Doxycycline. And the way I remember this, once again guys, it really helps if you... It helped me, to be honest, to create little stories, little mnemonics to help remember the high yield and information in general. And honestly, now three to four years later after graduating, I still remember these little things, these little mnemonics, and the rest of the material is just a blur. So the way I remember human bites to the hand, augmenting, and I would just be like, ow, that's a big bite. Ow, that is one big human bite. Augmenting, ow. Question number two, stable patient with a chest pain after EKG and a chest x-ray, we should give them what? So with a patient that is stable with a chest pain, they should be getting aspirin. Patient with a chest pain, a normal EKG that shows a widening of the mediastinum on a chest x-ray. So right here we have the heart. This is the mediastinum. This all should be like absent right here. This should all be lung. So you can see this widening right here. So that is indicative of aortic dissection. So the next best step is CT consult, cardiothoracic consult, and imaging is CT and geography. So there's several questions they can ask you regarding uh, aortic dissection. One of the side things to remember, uh, one of the drugs associated with the cause of aortic dissection is cocaine. Uh, next best step is, uh, they're going to ask you what is the next best thing for this patient, because if this is left untreated, the patient can die soon. So you want to consult cardiothoracic surgeons, and if possible, you're going to get a CT angiogram right away. Ischemia without necrosis is what? So ischemia without necrosis is unstable angina. You're going to see ST depression or T-vape inversion. So the stem 
patient is ischemic, but there is no necrosis, you're going to see some ST depressions, dash, and if it's unstable angina, they'll tell you patient has substantial chest pain lasting greater than 10 minutes. It should make you all think of unstable angina. Left bundle branch block is considered equivalent to what? So LBBB, left bundle branch block, is equivalent to STEMI. In which leads do we need more than one millimeter to call it a STEMI? So they're going to give you a STEM, uh, they're going to list different leads, and they say in which one of these uh, you need more than one millimeter to call it a STEMI, and that would be V2 and V3. So they can, again, you can see how they can make a question. Vice versa, if you only need one millimeter in V2, 3, then you can call it a STEMI. Left bundle branch block, EKG, will show what? So again, the STEM may say a patient comes in with a chest pain, they're going to show you an EKG that has a left bundle branch block. And so what you're going to look for, for a left bundle branch block, it'll look for that M, that bunny ears in a V6 lead. Right bundle branch block, EKG will show the bunny ears, the M in the V1, broad and deep S wave in the V6. And the way I remember that, that one M, that one bunny is right. So that one M in the bundle branch block is right. So basically another way you can remember this without confusing yourself, in which lead are you seeing the M, the bunny ears? V1, it's right. That one M is right. The one is right. Right bundle branch block, V1. V6, it's the left one. So that one is right. That one is right. So I just, or summarize it, it'd be like, when it comes to bundle branch blocks, you know you're going to see those bunny ears. Here they are. Okay, here they are again. So if you're saying like, well, which lead am I seeing at one? It's like, oh, I'm seeing it at one. So that one is right, 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 random branch block. If it's six, it's left. One, right, six, left. Okay, there's a, and then you're gonna see the deep S wave in B6. That one is right. EKG must be read within a what time frame? So a patient comes in with a chest pain, you're going to get an EKG, and a question may ask you, well, what's the time frame this EKG must be read in? So this is a typical pimping question in your EOR rotation, and you can probably see it on your exam, and that would be within 10 minutes. Monitoring heparin, order what lab? So if somebody comes in and they tell you they're on heparin, you need to get PTT. So that's another pimping question. So a patient comes in with a prior stents or something and they're on a heparin and they're going to ask you which lab would you like to order and answer is PTT. PT INR is for warfarin. So that's another differentiator. So they're going to say would you like to order PTT or PT INR for heparin? For heparin is PTT. For warfarin is PT INR. Bex triad. Hypotension, JVD, Muffled heart sounds. So they're going to give you a stem. Uh, if the patient is hypotensive, on a physical exam, you notice a JVD. Uh, and then I also have muffled heart sounds. And they're going to ask you, what is this triad called? And your answer is Beck's triad. So guys, so I hope you like this kind of questions. This high yield. You can see how it significantly helps retain the information. And it can significantly help you uh, with your exam, pass the pens, pass your EORs. I put all of these questions, there's about 3,800 of them, in a book that I put together. You can find it on Amazon for 20 bucks. Help me grow this channel. Hit that subscribe button for extra good luck on your exam. And let's continue. Tension pneumothorax triad. So they're going to come... In a STEM with scenario that patient comes in with the hypotension, JVD, and instead of decreased muffled heart sound, you're going to have absent breath sounds. So the first two are from the back triad, but this one, you're going to see a patient is hypotensive. 
there's JBD present on a physical exam, and when you listen to it, there's no breath sounds on that side of the lung, and that should make you think of tension pneumothorax. Also, in tension pneumothorax, you'll see a trachea deviation away from the side. Anterior V1, V4 leads are which artery? So the stem could ask you about differentiating different arteries according to the EKG findings. They're going to tell you if something is off with the EKG between a V1 and V4 leads and ask you which of the arteries is most commonly affected. So anything with the V1 to V4, it is LAD. And the way I remember this, anterior, I always say it's just like in the military, great lads step up. Great who steps up or in life. Who always steps up? Well, the great lads do. So great lads step up to the interior. They step up to the front. Interior, V1, V4, LAD, great lads. Aortic dissection presentation. So they're going to ask you about presentation symptoms of the aortic dissection, and that would be the tearing pain, ripping chest pain that is radiating to the back. Plus, this patient is going to be in a severe distress and in diaphoresis. So they may also tell your patients on cocaine um, with a super sharp chest pain that is tearing it to the back. Patient is in distress, has diaphoresis, what's the most common cause of this? And it's going to be aortic dissection. You should be consulting cardiothoracic surgeons and if possible obtaining a CT angiogram. Mallory Weiss causes bleeding and a beer hives causes what? Mallory Weiss, that's their retching after a night of drinking. They may have some bleeding, but the boar hive will cause sepsis. That is a rupture of the esophagus. Most common cause of pericarditis. So they're going to give you a stem. You're going to recognize pericarditis, and they're going to ask you what is the most common cause, and that would be Coxsackie virus. Positional chest pain better with leaning forward. So with pericarditis, Patient says they're going to have, have this chest pain that is significantly better if they lean forward. And the co most common cause is Coxsackie virus. And I remember this by just a little story saying pericarditis sucks. It hurts. Pericarditis gets better with leaning forward, but generally just sucks. It hurts. Suck. Sucky virus. Coxsackie virus. Pericarditis sucks. It hurts. Coxsackie virus. Pericarditis with fever and an elevated heart rate, respiratory rate, you should be thinking about myocarditis. Patient has fever and leaning forward helps. So myocarditis, you're going to have your patient that says, it's not just pericarditis, with fever, it's myocarditis. Pericardial tamponade chest x-ray will show what? Pericardial tamponade, chest x-ray, it will show that bottle-shaped heart. And here it is, guys. So you can see the shape of the heart is just like huge. And it looks like a bottle. So if you see this, it should make you think of pericardial tamponade. So they may show you a chest x-ray. They may not. They may ask you what you could expect to see. It's a bottle-shaped heart. They may say patient comes in with a chest pain, you obtain an EKG, which is XYZ. Uh, they show you a chest x-ray and they see this bottle-shaped heart, pericardial tamponade. If patient took cocaine, don't give them which medication. So in a stem, they'll tell you patient was out and partying or, you know, he's addicted to cocaine, and they will say which one of these medications should not be prescribed to this patient. And the answer is beta blockers. Beta blockers do not mix well with cocaine. And the way I remember this is bye-bye, say no to the cocaine. BB, bye-bye, say no to the cocaine. Who says no to the cocaine? Bye-bye. Bye-bye cocaine. I don't want it. So bye-bye cocaine, beta blockers. ACE inhibitors can cause what besides the cough? So they're going to tell you also in a stem, maybe just a cough question. Uh, patient has unexplained cough. 
you ran all the tests, no asthma, no viruses, nothing, nothing. But they started a new medication. Which of the other medications most common cause of cough? That would be ACE inhibitor, but they also can cause angioedema. So the swelling of the mouth uh, and cough all related to the ACE inhibitors. Most common cause of cardiac arrest in children is what? And that would be the respiratory arrest. So in infants, a respiratory arrest will lead to the cardiac arrest as a most common cause. Most common pneumonia bug is, I think this one is kind of easy to remember, a strep pneumo. Pneumo means lungs, pneumonia, it's in lungs. So most common cause of community acquired pneumonia would be strep pneumo. Pneumonia site of care is determined by what? So when it comes to pneumonia, and they're going to ask you what's the best treatment option, should the patient be admitted or not, how to treat it, follow the CURB 65, you'll have your answer. So pneumonia site of care is determined by CURB 65. So they also can give you a stem asking about pneumonia. They can give you uh, different forms, and the CURB 65 is the one you should look for. Outpatient pneumonia treatment, that would be azitro and add augmentin if the antibiotics were given within the last 60 days. AZ got the PNA. AZ got the PNA. I don't know how good of a mnemonic that is, but it helped me remember. I would just say, who got a pneumonia? And I said, that little, that little zit on somebody's face, that AZ. Oh my God, the zit is annoying, but it also got pneumonia. It's disgusting but it helps me remember. So azit got the pneumonia. So how do you treat pneumonia? Azitro, azit. You're gonna add augmentin. So that's another question they can ask you. Say, for this patient, you would like to add what? So what's the treatment option? So they can give you a stem that says patient was treated with 10, 60 days of antibiotics for whatever they choose to list. But if you see that patient was treated within the 60 days, and now they got pneumonia, then the AZ got a pneumonia, azitro, but you're also going to add augmentin. AA play for antibiotics within the last 60 days. Double A for antibiotics within the 60 days. Azitro and augmentin. What's a lights criteria used for? It is used for plural effusion. Four-year-old with a temperature of 40, tachycardic, in distress, drooling, sore throat, and a strider. This all should make you think of what? Epiglottitis. Patients will not be coughing. So epiglottitis patients, they will not be coughing. They're going to be sitting in that tripod position. They're going to have a strider. They're going to feel a distress, drooling, and it's just a high temperature. So tachy, sore throat, epiglottitis. You want to get that lateral neck x-ray. Do not perform a physical exam. Do not look in their mouth. You only make it worse. Another question is that you may want to take this patient to the OR to establish the airway if it's progressing. Epiglottitis, most common bug. Hemophilus influenza, Hib. Hib is the most common cause of epiglottitis. Antibiotics for epiglottitis treatment. You want to give them a ceftriaxone to cover the H flu, plus Venco or clindamycin. So they're going to give you a stem. Patient has that triple D, distress, uh, drooling, diaphoresis or something. Uh, and they're going to ask you which one of these antibiotics should be given for a patient with epiglottitis. And it is ceftriaxone to cover the H flu, and plus you want to add vancomycin or clindamycin. Most common croup bug. So they're going to give you a scenario of the patient with that seal-like barking. And they're going to ask you which following bacteria is the most common cause. And the answer, the most common bug, not bacteria, uh, is parainfluenza virus. Parainfluenza for croup. Seal got a flu. Parainfluenza flu. Parainfluenza, patient comes with a barking cough like a seal, and you say, what happened to that seal? Well, seal got the flu. Para flu, parainfluenza virus. Most common bug for croup, seal, 
is parainfluenza virus, flu. Seal got a flu. If the PE patient has contrast allergy and can't get a CTA, what's the next best test? That is BQ scan. So if the patient has emboli and has a contrast allergy or maybe the patient is pregnant. So you don't want to get a CTA because CT has radiation. So the next best test would be a VQ scan. So the scenario could be a pregnant patient that comes in and suspects a PE with positive Holman sign. You press on the calf and they have pain. So that's indicative of DVT. You want to get a PE testing done, but you cannot get a CTA. So the next best test is VQ. Pulmonary embolism can get a CTA VQ scan. Could be due to the allergy or due to the pregnancy. PE EKG findings. So they're going to give you a stem. They say a patient has pulmonary embolism and which of these EKG findings are indicative of embolism. And that would be prominent S wave in a lead 1, Q wave in a lead 3, and inverted T wave in a lead 3. S1, Q3, T3. That is the easiest way to remember that is a pulmonary embolism in play. S1, Q3, T3. Pregnant PE patients should receive which anticoagulation? This is a really common pimping question as well as a testing question. So if you have a pregnant patient and you want to put them on anticoagulations, that is a low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin for your pregnant patients that need anticoagulation. So it's an easy question to create. Patient is going to be coming in. They're going to find out that they got EKG findings of S1, Q3, T3. And they're going to ask you which anticoagulation is the best choice for this patient. And your answer should be low molecular weight heparin. RSV presentation. So RSV, I know it's associated with the infants, usually less than one years old. Most common cause of infant, infant hospitalization. There's another question. What's the most common cause of infant hospitalization? Could be, that's the answer is what, what RSV. And then uh, you're going to present with a wet cough. Intercostal retractions, scattered crackles, and expiratory wheezes bilaterally, decreased pure intake, and they'll have a fever. So if you see scattered crackles on exam, you're going to have that intercostal retractions that is probably the, the most commonly easily noticed on a physical exam. And they're going to have that vet cough, not seal-like cough, like in croup, but it's going to be like a vet cough. You're going to observe bilateral wheezing on exam and decreased PO intake is reported by mother and fever is present. You should be thinking RSV. Curly B lines. Bat wings, JBD, bilateral lower extremity edema, S3, crackles in the base, all of this should make you think of acute decompensated heart failure. Curly B lines will be seen like down here by the claustrophenic angles. It's going to be like a little lines and a chest x ray. Okay. Then a JBD on exam, bat wing, you're going to see like a full wing around the heart. And then it crackles in the base. All of that should make you think of decompensated heart failure. All patients with ADHF should be given what? Diuretics, furosemide. Acute decompensated heart failure, patient need furosemide. They need those diuretics to like flush that water out. And the, one of the good um, tips I can give you guys while you are on your uh, rotations because a lot of schools do not teach the dosing because it will be just like too much information. So while on your rotation, write down a dosing for all of the medications you're given uh, for yourself so you can reference later during your practice or during your next rotations because when you're presenting the, to your uh, preceptor saying this is a patient with acute decompensated heart failure, I think they would benefit from uh, furosemide. I like to start them off with 40 milligrams. I'll continue beta blockers but never start one. Uh, so the question could also be, patient comes in with a heart failure, uh, they already taken some kind of beta blocker, metoprolol for instance, um, 
Should we continue it? Should we stop it for 48 hours? X, Y, Z. The answer is you will continue, but you will never start a beta blocker in somebody with a heart failure uh, initially. So diuretic furosemide, 40 milligrams to start with. Continue beta blocker, but don't start one. So you see how they can play with the questions, but knowing that you do not start a beta blocker, but you can continue it, that high yield right there will always help you in selecting the right answer. Kid with a lip swelling, which has no concern to him. Mom says she has similar episodes when she was pregnant too. And you see this kid has just got like the swollen lips. That should make you think of hereditary angioedema, which is autosomal dominant. So there's like two questions right there. So they may give you a stem that says, kid comes in with a swollen lips. Mom is not concerned. She says she had a similar episode when she was pregnant. Uh, what is this disease that is autosomal dominant? And the answer is hereditary angioedema. Or they can say this is hereditary angioedema, which is autosomal dominant. So hereditary angioedema, autosomal dominant. Scabies treatment. So they're going to give you a stem. It's going to be pretty obvious the patient has scabies, and they're going to ask you what's the best treatment for this patient, and it is permethrin 5% cream. So the way I remember this, uh, if the scabies want to park it, they need to pay the permit, and the permit is 5 bucks. Scabies need a permit to park it, 5 bucks, 5% 5 cream. So if you just remember scabies, park it, permit, permethrin, $5, you'll never get this question wrong. Scabies need a permit to park it, five bucks. Painful rash on the face that started as tingling, but now the full rash is painful. Patients got a blurry vision on that side. That is the herpes zoster. Painful rash, blurry vision, herpes zoster. Involvement of tip of the nose from herpes zoster should make you tip of what? So they're going to tell you either during your rotation or in your exam, patient has herpes zoster and now you're seeing a rash on the top of the nose. That is Hutchinson sign. With this, you should be concerned about a patient losing his vision. So another question could be, patient has a history of herpes zoster, uh, now there is a lesion noted on top of their uh, nose which is Hutchinson's sign, and you are most concerned with patient's vision. Hatch has an itchy nose. Who has an itchy nose? Hatch. I just think of a little doggy named Hatch. He always has an itchy nose. Itchy nose, lesion on the nose, Hatch, Hutchinson sign. Check out their vision. Herpes zoster treatment. Acyclovir. So always with the herpes, think of acyclovir, easy guess. Herpes rides a bicycle. Cyclovir, cycle, cycle, that's what I, acyclovir, cycle, and I just like, if I wanna treat herpes, I need to get him on a bicycle. Herpes rides a bicycle. Erysipialis versus cellulitis. How to differentiate? Erysipialis has well marked lines and it's superficial, where cellulitis doesn't have lines, and it's deeper. Both will have the hot appearance, and both of these may have fever on their presentation. So they're going to tell you, patient comes in with the fever, uh, there's a rash that is hot to touch, and one is going to be superficial, and the other one is going to be deep. If it's deep, hot, fever, cellulitis, superficial, well-marked, Hot with fever, erysipialis. So just look if it's deep or surface with fever. That's how you differentiate. Sudden aggressive soft tissue infection. So you're going to tell your patient has really acute soft tissue infection. Uh, just happened within like a day or two. So that should make you think of necrotizing fasciitis. Soft tissue emergency. Get burn consult, surgical debridement, and it's an larynx score. 
So Elring score is more like a pimping question. I don't think you'll see this on the exam. But if you see necrotizing fasciitis, this is a soft tissue emergency. Uh, you'll need a burn consult. That's another question. They can give you a sudden aggressive soft tissue infection. You recognize the necrotizing fasciitis. And which consult would you like to place? And that would be burn. Because uh, this patient will likely need a surgical debridement. Steven Johnson syndrome versus TEN, percentage of the skin involved. With Steven Johnson syndrome, is going to be less than 10, and TEN is greater than 30. So I always remember this in burns, 10 is 30. When it comes to burn skin percentages, 10 is 30. 10 is 30. TEN is greater than 30. Steven Johnson, less than 10. So they're going to give you says patient has. 40% of their skin involved. Well, you know it's more than 30, so that's TN. Most common drug causing Steven Johnson syndrome. So they're gonna give you a stem where the patient has skin involvement, it's less than 10%, and they say which one of these drugs is the most common cause? The answer is sulfa drugs. So it's usually Bactrim. Uh, or they can say, if you have a patient that's starting in a bathroom, you should be concerned about Steven Johnson syndrome. Sulfas, onset 9 to 14 days after, treat like a terminal burn. Usually they ask about bathroom. Most common cause, most common drug causing Steven Johnson syndrome would be bathroom sulfas. Which incontinence is seen in cara equina? So they're going to give you the symptoms of cauda equina. Uh, patient has a bilateral backward leg pain, saddle anesthesia, uh, bowel and bladder issues, and they're going to ask which of the following incontinence is most commonly seen, and that would be the overflow incontinence. Tenderness at midfoot, tarsal metatarsal joints. So they're going to tell you patient is a runner. Uh, it may have some new tenderness right down at midfoot, uh, tarsal metatarsal joints. That should make you think of Liz Frank. Uh, on an x ray, look for that step off sign. And the way I remember this is Liz stepped off and got hurt. So who stepped off? Liz. Liz stepped off. Liz is a runner. She stepped off and she's got this step off. See, this should be all smooth. And now you see this step off. You can see the step off. A step off in a foot, you should think of Liz Frank every single time. Liz Frank on the x-ray step off. Who stepped off? Who's got the foot pain? Liz does. She stepped off. She got injured. Bilateral burns, fractures of the C1 is called what? Bilateral burst fracture of the C1 is called what? They're going to give you a stem, they're going to show you a CT with a C1 that shows bilateral burst fracture and that is called Jefferson's. Jefferson's fracture is unstable. It's a really typical spine pimping question. Uh, which one of these C spine fractures is bilateral, it's classified as a burst fracture um, and it's Jefferson's. Colicky abdominal pain in elderly patients should make you think of what? A colicky abdominal pain in elderly is a rapture triple A till proven otherwise. Another really commonly pinned question in ICU inpatient medicine during your ER, uh, ER rotation. So every time colicky abdominal pain in elderly, rapture triple A till proven otherwise. Most common cause of hemorrhagic stroke. Berry aneurysms or AV malformation. So they're going to tell you this is a hemorrhagic stroke. What is the most common cause? And the answer is berry aneurysms or AV malformation. They will never list both of them in the answer stem. So just look for one of these two. All right, guys. Now, last question is a great EOR review. Which vitamin deficiency can cause a seizure? So they're going to give you a stem that has a patient with a seizure. And they say... If in the labs, this is what we see, which one of these is the most common cause. So in your labs, look for B6 deficiency. And the way I remember this, he had six seizures until he took B6. Or, seizures start with S, so does the 6. So if you look at all the vitamins, 
you're going to say B1, uh, B6, B12, XYZ. You can say, well, seizure starts with S, so does number 6, B6. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you very much. We made it to the end of another great EOR review. I hope you find this content helpful. Tell your classmates if you do. Hit that subscribe button for extra good luck on your exam. You will do great. Uh, check out other videos. And best of luck on your exam. Best of luck with pants. And I'll see you in our next video. Talk to you later, guys. Bye.